Well, you'd hope too that for one of our the largest sectors in our economy, something good has come out of a turbulent year that they have had. And I'm talking about the farmers. Oh, those dirty dairy, dairies, the people who are destroying the environment, who need to be taxed, controlled and beaten into submission. The people who make stuff we don't want to eat anymore because we're all eating plastic meat, or sorry, non-meat meat, uh, lab meat or whatever you call it. Um, we're all having almond milk. Um, and really, who would be a farmer? And then you got the weather, um, which is changing and it's all their fault. Um, but I don't know, I get the feeling that we've refocused a little bit on farming and one of the people who's kept us up to date with what is going on in that sector, and I thank him for it, has been the uh, president of current president of Federated Farmers, Andrew Hoggard. He's always been happy to talk, as indeed he is this morning. He's on the, the phone now. Andrew, how are you? Season's greetings. Uh, good morning, Mr. Bad, Sean. Good. So how would you sum up the year for your members, for the farmers? Um, I think he did a pretty good summary before. Um, yeah, pretty a, a very frustrating year with a hell of a lot of legislation that's not that well thought out and um, going to have quite an impact on on farmers. Um, Weather-wise, yeah, that's helped some, hasn't, hasn't helped others, so mixed bag there, but... On the uh, commodity front, um, well, the prices are looking good, although, unfortunately, the input costs are also pretty high. So, um, yeah, we're still Swings getting a decent Swings and roundabouts. Margin. Mind you, Andrew, have you, ever met yeah. a, have you ever met a farmer in a pub who says, oh, it's going great, best year I've ever had? <laughs> never. Never. Yeah, it never happens. <laughs> never will happen in the history of humankind, I don't think. Yeah. Andrew, it used to be, I suppose, to be a farmer. You had to have some working knowledge of animal husbandry, perhaps, of crops and... Weather cycles, you had to have a pair of gum boots, a black singlet, and a can-do attitude and be prepared to, to work pretty hard uh, all hours of day of night and, and, and live the job. It would seem to me now that farmers almost need a law degree or certainly a lawyer on hand and an amazing knowledge of bureaucracy and, and, and what pieces of legislation mean. Has the very nature or is the very nature of farming changing? Uh, certainly in my time, um, so I've been 98 was when I first started share milking, um, so that's 24 years. Certainly it's changed from, if I look at the simple thing of shed inspections, way back when I started it was about making sure the cow shed was miraculously clean, um, that there was absolutely no sign of dirt or anything anywhere. Nowadays the primary focus is on your paperwork. Um, <laughs> And, and that sort of, yeah, it's just changed over those years. So there is a hell of a lot more focus now on reporting and crossing I's and dotting T's and having all of these things to prove stuff supposedly to customers. Um, but, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure yeah. whether customers are that excited by all this stuff or mm. whether it's still price at the end of the day. Mm. Climate change has, for a variety of reasons, not all of them particularly logical, given the figures that we see coming out of the UN and the fact that global warming isn't predicted to be as bad as uh, some thought it would be, who've been running around with their heads chopped off. But it has become an incredible driver of policies in, I guess, liberal, or some would say woke governments around the world. Uh, and, of course, the Paris Accord is a stick with which farmers are often beaten. I've been looking at, um, in Europe, particularly the Netherlands, what is happening there in terms of farming. Internationally, therefore, your sector is copying it, isn't it? Yeah, there's a hell of a lot of pressure internationally, although I'd say, from what I know from overseas colleagues, New Zealand is kind of alone on how we are... Um, approaching climate change in terms of putting a price on emissions. Um, n no other countries are considering that. Um, in fact, they're looking at more of carrot approach or they're looking at, okay, if you don't meet the climate goals, then we don't give you as much subsidy. Not that we take money off you, it's just we don't give you as much money. So that's probably the difference. And I'm you know, starting to see a lot more in the commercial sector um, I guess CEOs who don't want to 
like you have dirty, smelly protesters outside their offices. So they, um, you know, saying all the right things around climate change and sort of putting the pressure on there. Um, whether the actual customers are that concerned um, or is it still again about price, I don't really know. Um, I would hazard a guess that at the end of the day, most people, particularly right now, it's the, the price and the quality um, and then sort of those environmental attributes would come second. But, yeah, we're starting to see not just from the government but also companies are starting to and banks are starting to talk about all this stuff as well. Um, which makes it tough for you guys to do what you do, and that is you make produce. You make stuff often we can eat, um, and, and everyone in the world can eat. I, well, I've also seen, I guess, a change, and on, maybe militancy is the wrong word, Andrew, but we've seen the formation of, of Groundswell, which isn't like trying to replace federated farmers, but certainly uh, seems to me to present a more militant or politicised voice for some in your sector. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, it's one of the challenges we have in feds is we uh, try to be apolitical, um, try not to make it personal, trying to keep it focused on, you know, the piece of legislation, et cetera. And, you know, there, there is a, a feeling amongst farmers who often just want to get straight into the political party um, and opposing that and perhaps just being a bit more um, blunt and I think Groundswell's filled that niche that um, at times it's hard for us to, you know... So you're not um, dumping on them here, you're saying they represent some legitimate views that because of the historical nature of your organisation you really can't get into. Oh, we can, but it's it's more of a diplomatic mean. I've still got to keep doors <laughs> open. Yeah. Um, although my diplomat diplomacy is um, dropping away quite it's remarkably. It's wearing a bit thin, Andrew. Which, <laughs> yes, yes, yeah. Mm. Um, so, look, I mean, most of the issues uh, we'd be in complete agreement with them on. Um, they just, uh, yeah, go about it a slightly different way. Mm. What trends have we seen overall in farming, uh, Andrew? Is dairy conversion down or stopped? What are the hot things? What are the trends out there um, in the sector? Probably, yeah. I mean, everything's sort of stayed static uh, for the last couple of years, really. Um, I'm not hearing too many dairy conversions, if any. Um, in fact, it's possibly going the other way, um, where you've got dairy... Um, particularly in Bay of Plenty, Northland, moving into more horticulture. Although that's probably struggled in this last year with um, all the challenges around staff for picking fruit. But, yeah, it's probably the trend. I guess the trend is everyone's just sort of bunkered down, really, um, which may not be a trend. But that's sort of what I've seen over the last couple of years is everyone just focusing on their businesses. Um, there's not really that much of a a drive amongst people to expand. Um, certainly am seeing a lot of properties on the market at the moment, so there's probably a, a few people that are, as we mentioned before, all the paperwork, you know, they're at that stage of life where actually it's probably time, good time, no kids want to take over the farm, so good time to sell up and um, just relax. Yeah. Andrew, the other thing, we've got a recession coming. We're already seeing uh, that reflected in the possible rise in interest rates or the rise in interest rates reflected in a tumbling residential property market. Uh, not all farms, of course, are in credit. A lot of them are dealing with banks to keep the finance to keep going or indeed just operational finance because of the seasonal nature of uh, income in the farming sector. Could the recession see... Some farms go under if, if the banks uh, can't find a way to, I don't know, tide them over? Um, you always will get some farms that will exit um, in any given year. and But I, I do think most... I, I'm not hearing that from farmers um, in terms of, you know the potential for the bank sort of foreclosing and saying you've got to get, um, we're doing a mortgage e-sale. Um, generally, that pressure actually came on when prices were good. Um, 
they were encouraging those people that always struggled to exit then. Um, but certainly the interest rates are, yeah, we, we've just completed our latest banking survey of the members and it's been a definite increase in, in that and also the amount of um, the average debt's gone up as well. So, yeah, it is, it'll be interesting. Normally, in a recession, actually, farming doesn't do too bad because end of the day, people can do without holiday or the latest new gadget, but they've still got to eat three times a day. So um, we usually do yeah. manage all right. Yeah. Uh, nice to see two field days back on. That must have been a nice end of the year. I'm presuming you went. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, the uh, yeah, Everyone was expecting it to be shorts and T-shirt weather, but the first day was, um, <laughs> yeah, was pretty, pretty much traditional Waikato weather. Uh, yep. Yeah. But no, it was, I guess, time of the year. I guess it's answered the question, when which should we hold field days? It's definitely we should hold it in winter because the number of people was definitely down, and that's mm. just due to the nature of so many things happening on farm at this time of year. But it was still a good turnout and still good good chatting with a lot of farmers about all the issues. Mm. Hey, I have to ask you, most of us, and I, you know, I, I work in a constructed industry, as it were, we can turn off, we can, we can shut things down, we've got two weeks, everyone's going away for a, a, a two-week break. And I often spare a thought, and I know some people in the farming sector, and this can be a busy time of the year. So you've got to spare a thought over the Christie holidays that a lot of people uh, working the land, working on the land, there's still stuff to do, isn't there? You can't shut a farm down for two weeks. The cows don't yeah, milk themselves. Yeah. No, they don't. Well, on some farms they do with the robots, but they're few and far between. Uh, um, no, yeah, yeah. But generally you try and manage it so there's minimal, minimal work to do. So... For us, my goal for Christmas Day is um, usually all we do is the milkings um, and, yeah, in between time it's just lie on the couch and read a book and <laughs> <laughs> hopefully no one annoys me. Um, then, yeah, you generally just try and plan to have the cows nice and close by the shed so everything's simple and easy that day. And often, you know, because you've still got work to do, the family often comes to you and so... There's often quite a lot of um, free labour to help get things done. So <laughs> Andrew, you're wrong. Not too bad. Ah, <laughs> oh, very good. What does next year hold? What are the challenges you have the sector has for next year, the same as this year? Is there anything particularly um, nasty coming down the pike at you? I think um, in terms of uh, um, government rules and regulations, um, this RMA reform will be the... Mm most considerable one in terms of where that pans out. We've certainly got a lot of concerns with it. Um, I, yeah, the, the economy will be a big one, how that impacts, um, whether or not um, input prices, you know, stay high. Yep. Um, you know, they're dropping off overseas, but also um, the commodity prices are softening as well. So, yeah, there's... It'll be much the same, you know, swings and roundabouts, like I said at the start. Um, you know, some things will be good and some things will be okay. annoying. Um, but at the end of the day, still got to wake up and milk the cows. And yeah. We've got an election stuff. coming too, Andrew, despite your uh, diplomatic credentials. That could have yep. significant, or will that have, would a change of government, do you think, um, have a significant impact on the sector in terms of policy settings and attitudes? Well, certainly... What they're saying, if there was a change of government, so nationals sort of said, you know, you know, we, we've got to remove some of the headaches and um, get it down to basics of let's, let's deal with a couple of key important issues and not throw everything up in the air at once. Um, I mean, if that was to come to pass, then yes, that would change change things in terms of the sort of rules and regulation people are, or the amount of stuff that's happening, um, they're still saying that they would be, you know, wanting to progress things like um, climate change or emissions pricing. Um, so that might not change. But then again, it'll come down to, you know, how much of a role does ACT play in the next government? Um, you know, if they are at 15%, say, 
you know, they could well have virtually a third of the government. In and which case you would feel have. that would make a government more farmer friendly? Um, certainly their policies, um, I dare say, uh, probably would be favoured more by farmers. Um, and that would probably, yes, I, I would think most farmers would probably be. Yeah. Oh, I'm really interested in this, Andrew. One. Does Act, has Act in some ways moved into the ground that one would normally assume um, national occupied and that has been the farmer's friend uh, as and I think many observers would say national has been kind of tried to occupy that urban liberal ground Luxons has been criticised for not being definitive enough or old style Nats enough has that maybe made a few gains there? Oh, I would definitely say so Act has made gains in, in that area um, certainly you know yeah, at the pub you talk talk politics with people and um, that's sort of where they seem to land. So I do think uh, ACT has made a significant inroads uh, with the rural view, um, vote and, you know, Mark Cameron's doing a really good job in terms of getting out there around the country and um, talking to farmers and, you know, most farmers see in Mark someone that's very much like themselves. Yeah, and that's what we like voting for. Hey, Andrew, I do seriously want to thank you, um, and I know it's because of the hours you keep and the work you do, uh, but for uh, every time you've come on the platform uh, this year, um, it's been really good having someone uh, with your knowledge and connections to the sector to talk about what's going on. I look forward to chatting to you next year. No worries. Thanks a lot, Sean. Have a good Christmas and to all your listeners as well. Cheers. Andrew Hoggard there, the President of Federated Farmers. That's really interesting what he said about ACT. Act have moved in and become, and normally you said it's the Nats, they represent the farmers, the cockies. And he's saying that's not what's being discussed down at the pub or at the footy on a Saturday. Something different. And I would say, spare a thought for farmers, you've still got to run a farm even if it's Christmas Day or New Year's or whatever. I talk to so many friends involved in this sector and you see them over Christmas, well, I've got two days here, then I've got to go back and cut some hay or do this or do that. It's a job that quite simply just does not uh, stop. And personally, I'd say I think our farming sector has done well this year. They've kept going. They've had massive problems with labour supply. They have a hostile government in some ways. They have government-paid lobbyists who are trying to tell people not to consume their products, who would rather we make something in a lab than grow it on the land naturally, as God intended, um, but I've been reading some stuff lately, the old fake meat stuff, the non-meat meat, doesn't seem to have taken off the way the idiots who thought it would would. People still like a good steak. People still like natural produce. And do not forget, people, you might, um, your greenie mates might say dirty, daring, they're exporting. Um, farmers have got more interest in the climate and the planet surviving than you do. Their very livelihood is based on the turning of the seasons and being good stewards of the land that they farm. Um, so thank you to all the farmers this year. And really interesting too, just Andrew saying, look, Groundswell is allowed to push the boat out a bit politically a little bit more than we do. Um, I think the rise of Groundswell has been a very interesting phenomenon uh, this year. Um, and, of course, I think that basically came out of Dunedin or the Deep South. And Groundswell certainly part of the political landscape. And that is because our agriculture, our primary produce sector, says we have been hard done by, by, and I think largely the sort of greeny climate change uh, lobby or power block that has emerged in places like Wellington and Auckland. And parties that are largely... Um, uh, la their membership largely don't have any connection back with the land. And I mean, I don't really anyway. I know people who are, you know, one or two degrees separation by, you know, by relationship in my family who still farm. But it's a rarer and rarer thing that someone in New Zealand knows someone who farms. And I'm just going to try that out. Ben, do you have any direct relatives, no, one degree of separation who farm? No, he's looking around. What, how many? Like one. One. Okay, out of your whole family. There you go. Kelly? One. <laughs> yeah. Didn't used to be that way. Everyone had a family go for the weekend or they'd...
go on the school holidays and do some work. It just isn't like that anymore. Anyway, thank you, thank you to Andrew uh, for all your perspective uh, this year. And I'd also like to say thank you to all those in the Agriculture Centre. We get so many calls from people or texts from people who are on their tractor or in the milking shed. Um, and you were one of the groups I thought about when we set up the platform, the silent majority, people who didn't have much of a say and were getting a bit of a kicking from the woke. Um, and it's nice to know you guys got on board with the platform. I would ask you, of course, if you haven't signed up to be a subscriber. Oh, that's the other great news. New release over the weekend of the latest version of the app, so please download it. It makes identifying the host shows for download and listening offline way, way e easier. And we've ironed out some other kinks, but I'll be honest, that's the last update until we come back from the holes. We're done. We're done with updates, but it's really good. And we wanted to get it done before the break. So there's so much good content we've created. You can go download it, listen to it offline on the holes or somewhere else. So once again, I absolutely encourage you to spend the princely sum of just $3 a week and become a Platform Plus subscriber. And the latest uh, version of the app is out and it's... Oh, I, it's pretty damn good, in my opinion, in my humble opinion.